we used to have a saying among black people, we would say so-and-so is proper. Like, oh, they proper. What proper meant is you were the antithesis of what even black people maybe, maybe themselves thought about themselves, all those negative tropes. So you bring your best language, you present your, you know, and when you're at your home, your best China, you make sure that you can be seen as an exemplar of a human being. Mm. Yeah, mm, do that again. Mm. Mm. Not a, not an exemplar in your profession, not an exemplar in your school, but an exemplar just as a human being. I see. That's what we carry around. I keep coming back to this idea of how white or how black our networks or our, our social networks are, right? Um, and I, that being the case for a good number of people in our country, how much that perhaps plays a role in preventing us from getting beyond some of these challenges in racial relationships. You shared the way in which you feel people generally, people, white people and black people view you as a black person when it comes to um, intelligence or professional success or capability to be successful professionally. And I hear kind of loud and clear coming from you this strong motivation to aspire to that greatness and that success, right? And to, in some ways, represent Black people in a way that would make you in and members of the Black community proud, right? Yes. Yes. And I, I see you as a successful person. Like, I don't yes. see you as needing to prove anything else or to aspire to anything greater, unless you, in your own heart, desire that for yourself in your life. And I think there are at least a good, there would be a good portion of my network of people who are white who would actually see you the same. Now, I'm not suggesting, Andre, that they don't carry bias in some way, that there's not unconscious associations. At the same time, I think they would still see you as successful and capable. And to the extent that our networks are not mixed in the way that might we might ideally want, you know, like for our society, for our country, um, we don't get to see that. Like you don't get to see the 20, 50, 100 white people in my network who if they met you and they knew about what you've done in your life, just who you are as a person and as a professional, they would evaluate you in a very positive light. They would, but you don't get to see that, right? And so I wonder the way in which we, you and I and others, you know, stick to our own too much or not sometimes consciously, but sometimes, you know, just this is just the networks we're given, how much that plays a role in our beliefs about how others judge us. Um, and I, again, I'm not saying that, that that it doesn't actually happen. I just think the expectation that it might happen is probably greater than the extent to which the frequency with which it would actually happen. Um, in, in, again, in terms of this is just my network. And I, I hear you loud and clear when you share in past episodes how, Todd, you live differently. You, you grew up in Southern California and you have a particular kind of network that you know, you're you very recently came over, has a strong Jewish. I, I understand, I understand that I have that I'm different in, in certain ways when in compared to the broader white population, but I have networks beyond that. Like I know people who are not white people who are not <laughs> don't come from the same kind of background that I did, and just know that they would they would approach you in the same way that I'm describing. And 
I guess that's why I kind of come back to some of these questions of what what drives you to feel like you have to present in a certain way. Like I used to, I don't know if you, I don't know if I ever expressed this to you. Um, you know, I used to pick up your sayings and your tonalities and it would just come out of me like when I was back home, you know, or I would say something like, oh, I know what Andre would say about that. He's all that in a bag of chips, right? <laughs> and we would, no, no, this can come off. We would laugh about it, but not laughing you at You laughing at me. It was, that's funny. Mm -hmm, but so, you weren't laughing at me. So here, mm -hmm. so you got to understand the comparison of our experiences. You express yourself at university and get rebuffed and feel like you need to change. I am expressing who you are back home and people are not just accepting, but feeling joy around it, right? That they're, and and you got to meet my family. They they yes. you feel this way embraced you right. Yes, um, they, did. they did. And probably hopefully you felt it was somewhat natural. Um, yes, it was. It throwing was. yourself in a in a new context is always feeling you know unfamiliar and maybe uh, uncomfortable. But um, so again, I'm I'm trying to understand this different experience because I I have a different kind of network and I've had a different kind of experience in in the way that they people would appreciate you. In in being authentically Andre, not in being prepared and contrived Andre to try to fit in socially. And I understand that we're not talking about the professional <laughs> network. Do you understand why it's a little bit like I'm why I would have this motivation of really trying to understand? And I'm also trying yes. to understand the racial component of it, Andre, because I have adapted. I don't want to make make myself out to be someone who has not tried to adapt. When I had my first job, right? I started my own company out of college, had that for about a year. And then I got signed on by a company to do seminars and trainings, right? Um, and well, for, for sales um, and customer service. But when I started going out and doing trainings, I didn't wear, you know, t-shirts and shorts, certainly. <laughs> you know, I was up in front of a group. I was super yeah. young. I was 21 years old, talking to a lot of older folks. Like I put the the suit shirt on, I put the suit pants on, I put the nice shoes on. I didn't wear the tie because I just couldn't bring myself to do it. But, you know, <laughs> I, I cater to that audience. Now, slowly yeah. but surely that changed over time where I was like, okay, I can, I can wear a nice shirt, but not a collar. Like I could, I could downgrade it a little bit, right. Um, in a way that was comfortable for me, but I did adjust. And I think, I think it's a, it's a generally universal experience other than people who grew up in the kinds of neighborhoods you're talking about where they're really like prepared in this way um, to make an adjustment to the professional world. My question, and so given that we all in some way need to adjust to the professional world, right? We all in some way try to adapt ourselves to make sure we're accepted by our clients, our coworkers and the like. What what is it to you that you feel you needed to adjust that was racially defined in some way that was racially relevant, right? Because I had to adjust, but I'm assuming you think maybe I shouldn't assume this that there are components of who you think you are as a or how you express yourself as a black person that wasn't accepted. And, and I'm that's, part of, that's part of the coming from one of many, right? So what I had to shift were under what I had to learn was the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement when I was one of few around white people, mm -hmm. in in certain not all white people, but in certain settings, in certain settings of white people, right? Okay. Um, and I think um, yes. And so it's a it's a story in multiple dimensions. One of trans transitioning cast going transitioning cast. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, what you're defining as like an economic economic status situation. Right. So when you go when you when you're around one group of people with rules engagement and how they express themselves. And then now you're in a what they in a higher caste, I guess you say, then that changes. But when you're still, you, you know, representing or showing up manifesting using the rules of the lower caste, then there's there's a tension there. There's okay. a tension in, you know, externally with the people with whom you're communicating. And then once you become aware that they have attention, then there's attention in you. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out number one, how to repair the external situation so that you don't get booted out of the cast or the cast doesn't close ranks against you. 
And then number two, you have to learn how to reconcile yourself. So, you know, you learn when and how to present and so forth. Um, and so th that, that's when you ask the question, what do you need to change about yourself racially? And it's not, and it's not a physical thing, but there is a way of being, you know, even just when you're casual friends with people and let's say, you know, casual friends with working class black people, and then you're now among upper class or affluent white people, then you sort of have to, you have to become very malleable and read your audience and know, you know, how far to go, how far not to go when you're telling a story or, mm -hmm. or whatever, what to reveal, what not to reveal. Like it's all, it's very nuanced and it's very, I mean, it's not even a dance, it's a ballet. <laughs> and literally it's a ballet. So there's certain ways of expressing yourself that you feel, again, I'm trying to tease apart the economic and the, and the racial. So when I think about J.D. Vance's book and he talks about all the ways that he had to learn, like how you do silverware at a really nice dinner. And you should see my table right now. Yeah. Because that was the reason I was late to our conversation. You were setting it because, up. Yes. Yeah, so I was staging the table and I staged it exactly what in this example, like you're talking about. And you have to understand, I, I was not taught that, but I had to learn that so that yeah. when I host people, I know how to host them to their expectation. Uh huh. Yeah. So I, I never I still don't know how to do that. I never learned that. <laughs> Anyways, my point. <laughs> and you white. That's why this is so foreign to me. And this you're is just why it's so foreign to me. But but let's just take what you are saying in terms of adapting is very similar to what I heard, what I read in J.D. Vance's book. And, yeah. and so what you're talking about is this kind of increase of economic mobility or economic status, right? And so I'm trying to pull that apart from what you feel is is racial. And so you feel it sounds like there are some ways of expressing yourself that you would express that are natural to express within your in your black community or in the black community at large, that if you express <laughs> in that way, that you if you express in that way, you would be rebuffed. Like you like, be, like um let I because I, I just thought of a funny story that involved the two of us. Okay. Uh, and that's good because I love my favorite topic of conversation is food, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and so let's let's go on the lines of food. I remember when I went home. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I went home with you once during yeah. you know university. Yeah. Um, and we were hanging out at one of your friend's house. And I think we had gotten some like McDonald's. Okay. Where I come from, you eat the burger out of the box. And I'll never forget. I won't mention his name. I remember his name, but I won't mention it. When your friend was like, oh, don't you want to play? And I said, no, I'll just eat it. I said, no, you want to play. And I, was, and yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And, and I remember like, oh, you eat things off of a plate. You don't just eat out of the box. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And fast forward to all these years later, my brother was at my house. Oh, yeah. my God. And we were having a meal. It was just me and my three brothers. No mother, no anything like that. And keep yeah. in mind, we never hosted fancy meals. We never, we never even laid silverware on the table. You opened the drawer, got the silverware when yeah. you were ready to sit down and eat. Yeah. And my brother was eating without a knife. And I just yelled his name. I said, you know, whatever. And he just whipped his head around. And I said, use a knife. And he said, and he said, you just, you just yelled at me. Like I thought I was in trouble. Because <laughs> <laughs> I said, Brian. <laughs> and he whipped his head and I said, use a knife. <laughs> and yeah, that, so that's that's so it really comes from my interaction with being in white upper class environments and I not. How do you pull apart the, the racial component and the economic? You can't pull that apart. For me, for white people, maybe you can. For me, you can't pull it apart because- Yeah, I don't think you can because when you when you express like, I never ate, you know, at least not in any kind of, you know, uh, regular way, um, burgers on on a plate. Like you you ate them in the pack, in the, in the little wrapper that came with mm -hmm. it, right? Like that's how you ate it, right? <laughs> I mean, so I relate and that's why- I'm for really trying to understand. I'm not saying there's not a racial component to it. Um, I'm really trying to understand what is well, also, a, what is a black way of being and what's a white well, way. Well, no, what I'll tell you to help you understand is not necessarily a black way and a white way, but there have been so many sort of tropes and memes about black people of this and black people of that. That's why I'm hyper conscious of it. Like for example, 
black people eating fried chicken. Because I asked my friends and said, you know, we're going to premiere the show on Juneteenth. You think that's disrespectful? And one friend said, as long as you're not eating fried chicken and watermelon, I think you're good. Because what's the one, you know, they love fried chicken. First of all, I've been all around the world. Every culture has some form of fried chicken, like yeah. some form of it, right? I remember, I'll never forget, I was in Bangkok, Thailand, coming out of a nightclub, and a Thai woman was had an open drum, a large pot on a propane burner, frying chicken outside the nightclub. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'll be darned. And then here we are, Black people are supposed to be these big lip watermelon loving chicken eating people. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you, this is just, this is a smear campaign. So <laughs> a consciousness around ways of being as it relates to race are not, are, a, it, it relates to a consciousness of not trying, not reflecting the tropes that are out there so that you don't yes, have those associations. Yes, yes. Because what I'm trying to understand is, like if you went across the, the country, white, black, or otherwise, you would get a whole range of different cultural ways of being. And right. I'm not, and, 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 and I understand that professionally, there are certain norms that exist, norms that, like I said, I didn't grow up with, you know, may, or maybe to a small extent, my parents tried to, you know, get me to dress up nice and at certain points in time, but it was very, very, very little. I remember one time we went to a cotillion class, like oh, a wow. dance of some kind. And it just like, well, I never went back. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, there's no way I, you know, are you kidding? This is not me. I mean, I actually wound up learning social dance just because it was fun, but, um, <laughs> but this kind of proper way of, be, I mean, that was just like so far from the way I grew up to try mm -hmm. to inculcate anything like that into me was just not happening. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to, I understand there are these norms, but I also think there are just lots of variation in cultural communities mm -hmm. and, and we all right. have to adapt in different ways. And, and I'm, so I'm really trying to understand, is there a black white divide here or is there just, there is one, no, there is one. So what is it? You're right. You, what, Other than the tropes, are the tropes or what? All, all the other races of people with variation of cultural being and manifestation are not being showcased and denigrated as publicly as we are. So I think I'm understanding now. Y there are certain cultural expressions that have derogatory associations. And then there's the general derogatory associations of how people view, mm -hmm. have viewed, or at least white racist people have viewed white people lazy or... You mean you white know, racist people have viewed black people? Sorry, as, white, white you, racist people black people. I told my friends, criminals, stupid, and lazy. I right. told my friends. Yeah, and so what you're saying is in any way, if in any way a cultural expression either uh, played into something that was made fun of culturally or played into those general stereotypes, you and other members of the black community have felt and still feel a a motivation, a pressure to conform in a way where you won't be seen in that way. As that, they, yes, uh, that is what I'm saying. I see. What now, I what I colloquially call, because I love the way I express myself, bringing the tilly tally. The, and what, the what? <laughs> the tilly tally. What is that? The tilly tally. And what the tilly tally is is your because we used to have a saying among black people. We would say so and so is proper. Like oh they proper. What proper meant is you showed up in such a way to be mannerable. Like you were the antithesis of what even Black people maybe, maybe themselves thought about themselves, mm -hmm. all those negative tropes and negative means. Mm -hmm. So you bring your best language. You present your, you know, and when you're at your home, your best China. You make sure that you can be seen as an exemplar of a human being. Mm. Yeah, mm, do that again. Mm. Mm. Not, a, not an exemplar in your profession, not an exemplar in your school, but an exemplar just as a human being. I see. That's what we carry around. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand, <laughs> I understand. So, I'm like, we could we go to work on this show. Yeah. Healing race, we go to work. Because this yeah. is deep. This is really deep. I mean, until I've been crying for half of this. Yeah. I mean it's emotional to bring this up. Yeah. I mean, even the term that you're using is best, right? Mm -hmm. The best way of speaking or the best. And the question then becomes what's what's the what's the best way? I mean, I I I, I feel like people because do I often get criticized for 
whether I'm being proper. Um, I don't know if I get criticized for the way I speak, but um, you don't. But I, <laughs> I can understand. And again, it's really hard for me to really to, to to fully understand this because I just know how I think people in certain people, at least in my network, have or would accept you, however you express yourself. And so I'm trying to understand what are the contexts where this really needs to happen, right? And what are the contexts where it doesn't need to happen? Mm -hmm. um, and my sense from you in our other conversations is it's too much energy to even figure out. Mm -hmm. um, where you can be yourself, you know, whatever that means culturally and personally, and where you need to be proper in these ways. And so might as well be on the safe side and show up in those ways as a first show up in that proper way um, that follows the norms in case it might be a situation where you need to do so. Um, is that, am I, am I right in that? Is that? Yes. Thank you for watching this episode of Healing Race and stay with us for a scene from our next video. If you want to see more conversations like the one you just watched, please subscribe to our channel, share this video with friends and family, and like and comment on the video below. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real conversation about race, email us at guests at healingraceshow.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So please email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Now, here's a scene from our next Healing Race. Here's the question, I guess, that I would have around identity, because I talked in the last episode of having a very weak connection, if, if almost no connection to whiteness as an identity of myself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I hear you that people perceive me that way and then that comes with certain things. In your ideal world, if you can wave a magic wand about the way things are, would you identify with your color? Like, would that even be an identity? To watch the rest of that episode, go ahead and click the video below me. To see a different compelling Healing Race episode, you can click the video below me. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.